everybody welcome back to another edition of crafting and crime daily the monday edition no murder news today sorry to disappoint you but nothing going on with the murders today okay so what is going on here's what how was your weekend i had a fantastic mother's day you can see i did like a little drive live on the way back from my mother's day breakfast with the kids we didn't go out for breakfast. My son and my grandson made breakfast and they gave me flowers and a foot massager. <laughs> I don't know if I need a foot massager, but now I have one. I think I'm gonna get, I gave it to my sister. So here's what I worked on this weekend. I've Here's what I've decided I'm gonna do. Every weekend I'm gonna do 500 stitches on some cross stitch. So this weekend I did the equivalent of 500 stitches. Gosh, you can't even see that. It's so far away. I'll do an up close photo of it. There, it looks better from me, from the back. Now, what what you're seeing here is I have gridded the fabric, so there it's divided up into ten by ten squares. I've used a friction pi pilot erasable pen, so that when I'm done, all you have to do is apply heat. You could just like do a blow dryer, and this stuff goes away. So it's fantastic to use with your cross stitch. So that's. Uh, that's that one. I haven't started the bird one yet. And my sister says to me, you started another cross stitch? I did. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I got my, uh, got my breakfast here. I'm not going to tell you what time it is because I was up till five in the morning. And it's all my friend Mickey's fault because now she's got me reading, like not audible books, just reading. And it's so comfortable at night. I finish I have this routine, like I have to watch TV and I have like one or two hours of TV. And then I have these couple of games that I have to play in one game, one game. It's called Hearthstone. It's by Blizzard Entertainment. I usually end up playing two or three games because it's just, it's a card game. And it's so fascinating. And, and I get so frustrated because I'm like, I lost. I got to go back and try again. And then I lose again. And I get, and next thing you know, but after all is said and done and I'm ready to go to bed and I'm lying on my side and I got my cell phone and I'm reading and two hours go by. I'm like, I gotta go to sleep. I know. Oh my goodness. So that's what's going on with me. So I did have a really nice weekend. My sister made um, pulled pork. Oh, it's delicious. So that's what we'll be having again tonight. So I'm going to tell you the story about Taylor Mosley and his mom, Pashan Jeffrey. This is something that happened back on March 29th, 2023 in St. Petersburg, Florida. Now, I lived in Florida for 40 years, so I'm very familiar with Florida. I lived, I've lived on the East Coast and the West Coast, but there was a time that I lived on the East Coast and my dad lived in St. Petersburg. So I would travel when spring training was going on in St. Petersburg and I would travel over to where my dad was because he was in a wheelchair and I would take him to the ball games and because he was in a wheelchair we got great seats oh my gosh and <laughs> he loved the Baltimore Orioles so we would watch the Baltimore Orioles play whoever and it, and they have a dome stadium and so even if it rains, you're going to, you know, you're going to get to see a game. It's not going to get rained out, which is lovely. I'm trying to turn my light pad on here. Come on. Come on. Doesn't want to stay on. Okay. There we go. So here's what happens. Thomas Mosley, he is the defendant in this case, Thomas Mosley. He is 21 years old. He was born in 2002. Oh my God, he's a baby. 21 years old. It was his 21st birthday and his girlfriend, Pashawn Jeffrey, mother of, you know, his baby's mama, uh, she throws a birthday party for him and the family shows up at 4.30 and they're gone by 5.15. What kind of birthday party is that? What birthday party lasts 45 minutes? So here's what I don't know. Was there like friction during this party? Was, you know, was the vibe not good? You know how when you go to somebody's house, you could tell just something's off, something's going on and it, you're uncomfortable. And you so you get the birthday cake and happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. And then you just, you're out of there <laughs> or you take the cake to go. <laughs> so I don't know if that's what was going on here, but... A little bit about Peshawn. She was born and raised in St. Petersburg. 
very close to her mom. They used to FaceTime every morning. She, she graduated with honors and she was living the life of a single mother. But she throws this party for her two-year-old son's father and family, like I said, they're they're in and out 45 minutes. And so five, that's the last time Peshawn and uh, Taylin are seen at 5.15 p.m. So we find out later on that at 8.42 p.m., Thomas is seen leaving the Lincoln Shores apartments. That's where this birthday party occurred, at the Lincoln Shore apartments. He's seen leaving there, traveling about 10 blocks away uh, to this area called Lake Maggiore. So at 9.03 p.m., he shows up at his mother's house and he has severe hand and arm wounds on both hands and both arms. So they take him, they rush him to the hospital. They go, they go to St. Anthony's Hospital. He's admitted. He's not telling anybody what's going on. He, they, you know, he doesn't, no clue what happened to him. It's, but it was clear that it was from a, a something, you know, a knife that had slipped. So he gets admitted. Nobody knows what's going on. So meanwhile, the following morning on the 30th of March, Peshawn's mom, she's calling to do their morning FaceTime and Peshawn is not answering. So she gets really concerned and she calls the management of the Lincoln Shores Apartments and she said, hey, you know, can you go do a welfare check on my daughter? You know, every morning we have FaceTime. She's not answering. Um, you know, please go check on her. So this management, they go over and check on her. They, you know, they obviously have a way to gain entry into the apartment. They go into the apartment and what they walk into is gruesome, gruesome. Lying on the bathroom floor is Peshawn Jeffrey. We find out later on she has been stabbed over 100 times. So, but they don't find the baby. Where's the two-year-old? Now, interestingly enough, this baby that had just had a birthday a few days before this. So the, had, the baby had just turned two years old. The baby is not there. So the police put out an Amber Alert. Now, Amber, I think you guys know what an Amber Alert. That's where, you know, it sounds off on your phone and they, uh, they're, they describe the child, that where the child was last seen at this birthday party, what they may have been wearing at the birthday party. Um, and it, com it comes on your phone and it comes on your iPad. And, you know, so everybody, and like if you're on the highway, it's on those big signs. It's, it'll say Amber Alert looking for, you know, two-year-old uh, Taylin. So they call out. This is like a full out search going on. They have search parties organized. They're sending out drones to fly over the area. They've got uh, canine dogs, you know, looking everywhere. They've got a dive team going into nearby bodies of water. They are not finding this child. So finally, someone comes to, someone notifies the police that they have seen an alligator with something in its mouth. So the police go to this location where this alligator sighting is reported and they find the alligator and it has something in its mouth. So they shoot the alligator. When they shoot the alligator, it releases what's in its mouth and then they euthanized the alligator. I wonder how big it was. Oh God, I'd love to see a picture of this alligator. It had to be pretty big. Well, maybe it didn't have to be big. I mean, it was a two-year-old. Yes, the two-year-old was what the alligator had in his mouth. So they send the body of Talon to the medical examiner's office where an autopsy is performed, and they rule that the cause of death was drowning. So at the scene, the crime scene investigation team comes out and what they find is a bloody fingerprint on a cleaning bottle that is hidden underneath the bed in the apartment, um, Peshawn's apartment. And they also find a bloody shoe print with a Gucci emblem. Like, now I don't own any Gucci's, do you? Um, well, maybe you do, I don't know. But 
pretty distinctive footprints. So they tie all this back to Thomas and he is arrested and charged with two counts of first degree murder. I'm trying to see if I missed anything. Um, following the autopsy, Taylor and his mother were put to rest and memorialized. They set up a GoFundMe to cover the cost of burial for these two individuals. That GoFundMe pays raise $38,000 to help with funeral expenses. So nice of the community to do that. So what's going to happen to this guy? Like two counts of first degree murder. He has pled not guilty. Not guilty. So what... I would say is that absent any mental health issues, he doesn't have much of a defense. They found when the when they went to the apartment to check, do this welfare check, they found a bloody trail leaving the apartment. Now, I would imagine that that was tested and if it came back to him, that's probably another piece of evidence that's been collected. But um, absent any mental health issues. And he may claim, you know, not guilty by reason of insanity. Later on, he can change his plea from not guilty to not guilty by reason of insanity. We will see. The best thing he could do <laughs> is just take a, a, a plea deal, you know, 20 years, 50 years, you know, 25 for each person to run consecutively. It would still be better than the death penalty, which would tie him up in litigation for the next 20 years, um, at least, because Florida just, the death penalty in Florida is so unsettled right now. So unsettled. So I wanted to just take um, a few minutes to talk about the Lori Valadebel case. So after the verdict on Friday, there was a dateline. Yeah, a dateline describing, you know, an hour and 50 minutes of Lori Valadebel trial that would not have aired. Uh, there had to be, a verdict had to be reached before that could be aired. And so because the verdict came back early afternoon on Friday, that Dateline episode was able to be aired. It was filmed by Keith Morrison with the assistance of East Idaho News' Nate Eaton, who is the reporter that was in the courtroom where I got most of my information from because it was not uh, something that was covered live, you had to wait for the recording to come out the next day and listen to the recording. In any case, so I thought, you know, let me listen to this Dateline. I'm sure it's not going to be anything I have not heard before. I'm sure I've heard all of this information. So I am listening and I'm working, crafting, and I did hear something that I had not heard before. In October of 2019, now, as you may recall, in September, that's when we believe Tylee and JJ were uh, killed and buried in Chad Daybell's backyard. In October is when Tammy Daybell was shot at and then later on dies in her sleep from asphyxiation. So she had a little help there, but in, in any case, during October of 2019, another event occurred that I had not heard during this trial. Now, I don't know if it came out at trial or if I, and I just missed it, but, or maybe you guys had heard of this. I, I kept saying all along, I was concerned for Melanie Boudreaux or Melanie Pulowski, whatever you want to call her. This was Lori Valadebel's niece who had four children with Brian Boudreaux. I kept saying, where are those children? I hope they're safe because, you know, <laughs> retrospectively, we look how much danger they were in. So what happened was after Brian Boudreaux got shot at, you know, I don't know if you remember, he was traveling home. This little merry group of misfits that was following Chad and Lori had decided that, uh, Brian Boudreaux was dark and attempted to have him killed. And Lori's going to go on trial for that later on. But, you know, he pulls up to his house. There's a Jeep there that everybody believes belonged to Tylee Ryan. 
There's a Jeep there with a Texas license plate, missing wheel well, wheel on the wheel well. And uh, the window goes down in the back seat and it's, a gun comes out with a silencer on, on it, shoots out Brian Boudreaux's window. He survives, thank God, he's okay. So following that, he takes those four children and he goes into hiding. He hides those four children from Melanie. So Melanie, in October of 2019, Melanie and Alex, the Alex, the guy that probably did the murders or assisted with all these murders and then later died himself, she and Alex go try to find these kids. She shows up where the kids are. And somehow she figured out where they were. She and Alex show up there and she's trying to convince the police to go in and get those kids for her. And they're trying to tell her, listen, you're trespassing. You don't belong here. You know, we're going to have to issue a, you a citation for trespassing if you don't leave. And she wouldn't leave. She kept telling him, let's just go in there and see, make sure my kids are okay. And can you get them out and bring them out for me? And so I can take them with me. And I have, she had some kind of piece of paper that showed she could do this. And they kept saying, no, no. So they go in, they check on the kids. She, they, they come out, they tell her the kids are okay. They're fine. We're not going to remove them from this home. So because she won't leave, they upgrade her trespassing uh, citation that they issued her and they arrest her for domestic violating a domestic violence order. And then they walk over to, to Alex who's sitting in his vehicle and they say like, she's been arrested. And he's like, well, where do I go bond her out? So Alex goes over, pays $2,000 to bond her out and uh, they leave without the children. Thank God. Oh my God. Can you imagine? Cause <sighs> It could have been so much worse if they had found those kids or if she had gotten a hold of those kids. Now, she claims that she was, you know, she was just attracted. She wasn't following Melanie or she wasn't following Lori. She was just, you know, that was her aunt and, and she just loved her aunt and she wasn't a cult member. Well, of course she's going to deny it. She don't want to go to jail. I'm curious if there's going to be some charges against her. Uh, in the future related to all of this, you know, uh, Melanie, Zulema, some of these other merry band of misfits, you know, well, that's, that's just my perusing for the day. Let's do the crime calendar before we go. I know it's a Monday. It's rainy. It's icky outside. I know. So stay home and craft, right? All right, we're going to talk about the monkey jail, criminal animals. Where do criminal animals go? Like alligators, they get euthanized. Okay, from 1996 until the mid-2000s, in the city of Patiala in the Punjab region of India, I probably butchered that, but there was a jail that housed an unusual variety of violent criminals, rhesus Makaku monkeys, the 15-foot cell located in a zoo, was covered by a chain link fence and wire mesh to prevent any prison breaks. <laughs> yeah, God forbid. The inmates were a dozen of the region's more than 65,000 monkeys, specifically those that became uncontrollably aggressive. Oh yeah, just put them all together. <laughs> Let them go at each other. Some were destructive, ripping up lawns, smashing flower pots, defecating water tanks, and some were violent, slapping and biting people and threatening children with bricks. Oh, my. <laughs> After complaints from animal rights activists, the former jail was converted into a reform school for monkeys in 2009 <laughs> with the intention of rehabilitating the delinquent primates in the area rather than locking them up. Oh my God, this is for real. <laughs> Since then, the reform school has been extended into the neighboring forest with enough space for 100 monkeys. A quarantine area and a veterinary hospital were also built near the site. Aww. Speaking of wild animals. <laughs> yes, the rabbit is still here. So uh, when I got up this morning and came into the craft room. 
he was sitting there eating the cucumber and he was very close to the door. So I crept over there and he wasn't moving and I was going really slowly because I wanted to open the door, hoping he would just go out the door. And he seemed very interested, but instead of going out the door, he ran into behind the boxes. So eventually I'm going to get this thing out of my house. I mean, I'm not starving it to death. It's it, it loves the cucumber, sitting there nibbling on the cucumber, just like, oh, yum. But I'm out of cucumbers now, so I've got to find. I know he does eat the dandelion greens that um, we have growing in the yard, so I'll I'll get a handful of those for dinner tonight, apparently, if I don't get him out of here today. I might have a pet rabbit in my craft room. A wild pet rabbit. Yeah, imagine that. Okay, guys. <laughs> He seems harmless. He's just a little old thing, just a little itty bitty thing. I took a picture of him, but it, he's so dark in the picture, you can't even tell what you're looking at in the picture. So that's the show for today, guys. Short show today. Uh, not a lot going on, but hopefully tomorrow I'll have another true crime story for you today. Or maybe they're selecting a jury. Um, let's look. Let's see if Long Crime is selecting a jury today. Well not, well, not them, you know, the judge. <laughs> Let's find out. Let's look at Law and Crime. I used to get their newsletter. I don't know what happened. Law and Crime. Law and Crime dot com. So they have the Minister Murder and the OnlyFans Stalker Trial going on. So, hmm. I don't know if this is a new trial or if this is just a story. Yeah, it's just a story. Okay. Well, I might have another new true, true crime story for you tomorrow. All right, guys. I will see you then. Have a great Monday night, and I'll see you tomorrow on Crafting Your Crime Daily. Have a great day. Bye, everyone.